Thank you very much. Um, the first thing to say is that inevitably I have uh, got up on the screen the first of what I hope is going to be the only mistake. So when you see Salisbury Cathedral Treasure House, seen from the north, it is in fact Salisbury Cathedral Treasure House, seen from the south. <laughs> um, right, with that I will start. So the subject of my PhD thesis was the treasury of Thessarabi that forms part of every medieval cathedral or church. Such a building usually takes the form of an annex attached to the east end of the church within reasonable distance of the high altar. Its function as storehouse for the priceless ecclesiastical treasure belonging to the church meant that it was accessible to only a few privileged individuals. Nevertheless, many such buildings are resplendent pieces of architecture in their own right. Within these buildings were conserved the church's valuables. These included 1. Chalices, patterns, pyxes, candlesticks, censers used in services. 2. Relics were also preserved in treasure houses, enclosed in sumptuous reliquaries. 3. The books used during the liturgy, including large gospel books and psalters, were also preserved within the church treasury. 4. The treasury was also the depository for the church's vestments. 5. In addition, the treasury conserved the legal documents, which attested to the ownership of the church. And 6. Finally, it conserved the money given by the faithful. All these treasures were endowed with profound spiritual significance, but they were of immense value in worldly terms. In many ways, treasure houses were the predecessors both of modern museums and of modern banks. In studying their use, it is possible to discern the concerns of their creators to limit access but to all but a few privileged few while at the same time claiming that their contents were for the benefit of everyone. Concerns not unfamiliar in our region. So secure were these holy depositories that they were used by secular magnates to bank their valuables. For instance, in 1215, King John of England hid part of his own treasure, Vasa Pocoalia Aurea et Argenta, at Fountain's Own. In 1290 to 91, payment was made, and we may hear more about this later, for, quote, paving the treasure house of the king's wardrobe at Westminster Abbey. Erasmus described his visit to see the treasures of Canterbury Cathedral about 1513, which he asserted were by no means shown to everyone. Quote, he, Erasmus, I, in other words, only gained access because, quote, William Warren, the archbishop, had given me a letter of introduction. So, treasure houses their rooms and contents. During the Middle Ages, the ecclesiastical treasure house was often referred to as a thesaurarium, a treasury in the sense of a building containing treasure, as was the case at the Cathedral of Wells, whose statue specified that Prince Christie processions should leave the cathedral by the west door and make the circuit of treasury, cloister, and cemetery. Circuens thesaurarium claustrum cemeterium. <coughs> I was lucky to find an almost accidental reference to Lincoln Cathedral's treasury in a 13th century source concerning the houses <coughs> belonging to the dean and chapter that surround the cathedral. From a manuscript in the Cathedral Archives, I learned that a particular house, number 34, Minster Yard, no longer in existence, was described between 1263 and 1272 as lying to the south of the treasury. Since the location of the house is known, it's possible to confirm that the cathedral annex immediately to the north, that is the building that I had assumed to be the treasury, was indeed the treasury. Once it was firmly established, that this annex was a treasure house, it was possible to confirm as treasure houses other contemporary annexes to cathedrals which shared the same design as fittings. And fittings, 
These included that of Lichfield Cathedral, whose other chapel had been the depository for the head of St. Chant. Um, in France, examples include those at Bayeux Cathedral, at Beauvais Cathedral, and at Amiens Cathedral, now destroyed, whose upper chamber had housed the head of St. John the Baptist. The problems deriving from the use of the word treasury stems from its lack of precision. On the one hand, it may refer not to the entire building, but only to one room within that building, one whose sole function is to conserve valuables. On the other hand, the word treasury may be used for a collection of treasure rather than a building. Leo of Ostia, discussing the Abbey Church in Monte Cassino shortly before 1075, wrote, quote, beside the north apse, Desiderius built a two-roomed house for conserving the treasure used in the service of the church. Donus ad Thessarum re condemnus. A charter of 1241 belonging to the Cathedral of Notre Dame, Paris, refers to the cathedral's Donus Thessarus, treasure house. The advantage of this appellation is that it allows for the recognition that a number of rooms are contained within one building. Within the ecclesiastical treasure house, the most important, and indeed the only essential one, is the sacristy, named variously Sacristia, Sacrarium, and Secretarium. This was described by the 13th century theologian Durandus, quote, the sacristy or place where the holy vessels are deposited or where the priest puts on his robes is the womb of the Blessed Mary, where Christ puts on his robes of humanity. The priest, having robed himself, comes forth into the public view, because Christ, having come from the womb of the Virgin, proceeded forth into the world. In many abbey churches and cathedrals, one chamber did not provide enough room to store vestments, nor an area large enough for the celebrants to enroll, so that a second subsidiary space was provided for this activity, named the vestiarium or the re vestiarium. Sometimes, if one room combines the role of sacristy as well as that of vestry, it is named in sources as a vestiarium or re vestiarium rather than sacristia, secretarium, or sacrarium. This was the case in the 11th century constitutions, which Lanfranc of Beck, Archbishop of Canterbury, wrote for his monks. From examining the extracts from which the words secretarium, sacrarium, and vestiarium are drawn, it is apparent that they all look refer to the same chamber. Lanfranc's favour of the word vestiarium is important for English studies of treasure houses because the writers of English medieval documents often chose this name, or re vestiarium, for the chamber which in fact performs the dual role of sacristy and vestry. The essential role of the treasure house was to minister to the Eucharist. Christians would believe that the sacristy gave its sanctity from the presence within it of bread and wine, which have been metamorphosized through priestly blessing into the body and blood of Christ. This would be the case where the complete pieces of consecrated bread, the reserved sacrament, were kept in the sacristy, or whether the godly presence consisted in no more than minuscule traces of bread and wine still clinging to the Eucharistic vessels after they had been returned to the sacristy after Mass. There are many references keeping the reserve sacrament in the sacristy. Amalur of Metz in his 9th century commentary on the Ordo Romanus stated that the conserved host should be kept on the altar or in the sacristy. The instructions in the 13th century statutes of Cologne, the cathedral, are, are that on the feast of St. Peter in chains, quote, the sacrum, consecrated host, should be carried to the sacristy in the same way as happens on all other Sundays. The regulation of the Fourth Latin Council of 1215 dictated that the reserve sacrament was to be kept within strict care under lock and key. These strictures could be met through the use of a locked receptacle or cupboard if the Eucharist was kept as an altar within the main space of the church. Nevertheless, greater security could be achieved if the sacrament were conserved within the locked sacristy. During Passion Tide, on the night between Morning Thursday and Good Friday, the sacristy was often the locus 
Sacca, where the consecrated Eucharist was conserved. In the 12th century, Bishop Henry of Blois of Winchester, during whose bishopric a new sacristy was created, gave the cathedral an, um, quote, ivory pyx in which is placed the body of the Lord at Easter. Thus, the sacristy took on the role of the tomb of Christ. In order to perform this function, a suitably embellished niche or tabernacle was necessary. Here are examples at Bayer and Bristol. It was because of this sacred role that sacristies were provided with altars, although in Britain many of them lost their altar as a result of the Reformation. The sacristy was devoted to the cleansing of the Eucharistic vessels and the linen corporals after Mass. For this reason, a sink was needed together with a source of water. The sink or lavatorium is often embellished with decoration to match its sacred function. Examples shown here come from the sacristies of St. Peter Mancroft in Norwich and Bristol Cathedral. The water needed for the ritual cleansing of the Eucharistic vessels and the hands of priests before Mass needed to be warm. And so it was necessary to have within the treasure house a fireplace whose stove could also serve to light censers. Reference in 1260, Lincoln Consuetudines, made the role of the fireplace clear. It is directed that in preparation for Monday Thursday foot washing ceremonies, the servants of the church must heat up water on the stove in the treasury. It was therefore particularly satisfactory to find the fireplace within the treasure house at Lincoln, hidden behind centuries of partitioning and grime. Chimneys can also be seen on many treasure houses, including this one at Church Cathedral. Cupboards were an essential feature of sacristies, as were chests in which treasures were conserved. Among many examples of cupboards, here are original cupboards still in use, which I'm sure I'm not meant to be sharing you, um, <laughs> in the treasure houses of Canterbury Cathedral and Chartres Cathedral. At Trondheim, the importance of the sacristy's cupboards was signified by an internal string course, which hopefully, hopefully you can see on the left, which rises and falls around the areas of wall in which the cupboards are placed. The same distinctive string course acts almost as an advertisement on the exterior of the building to mark the presence of these cupboards and their contents on the other side of the wall. Finally, a way had to be found of storing vestments. Many cathedrals still use wooden coaches, although many of these have been out of the treasure houses where they were previously located. In 1901, people could still remember the vertical timbers of the coke, of, of the coke press in the west end of the vestry of Westminster Abbey. This had been described in the early 18th century as, quote, a set of cranes of wood swinging as if in a rack on which formerly the coke's investments in common use were hung. Treasure houses often contained, in addition to sacristy and vestry, one or more treasure rooms which were well protected, protected and difficult for access. An extreme case was at Bayer, where the 13th century treasure room was located above the vault of the canon's vestry and could be approached only by means of a ladder and access through the vault's central boss. Both Moyen and Wells Cathedral contained 13th century vaulted treasure chambers essentially strong rooms, discreetly located up the narrowest of mule stairs in positions that it would be impossible for outsiders to find. Right, I'm now going to go on to the location of treasure houses. Monastic treasure, treasure houses or treasuries were positioned on the side of the monastic building connected to the church. Thus, these private spaces, together with their contents, were enfolded within a layer of protection comprising the spaces of the church on one side and those of the monastery on the other. 
To show as clearly as possible the position of the various chambers, I've created a digital model of a generic monastery. The range of buildings which lay to the east of the cloister contained on the ground floor the sacristy cum vestrium. It was located adjacent to the east end of the church, as close as possible to the high altar. On the other side of it was the chapter house. On the floor above was the long monastic dormitory. Next to the dormitory, immediately to the east end of the immediately above the east end of the sacristy and the chapter house lay the treasury. Its location allowed easy access to the sacristy and its contents were protected not only during the day but also at night time by its proximity to the dormitory. The dissolution inventory of the Cistercian Abbey of Whaley, Lancashire, refers to, quote, a little chamber in Dortop in which were deposited 15 chalices with their patterns all gilt. Secular canons, on the other hand, had to meet the challenge that monks escaped because monks occupied, because canons, sorry, occupied their own houses situated close to their church but not physically connected to it. And because they acquired cloisters only in the late Middle Ages, their treasure houses did not enjoy the privacy of monastic establishments but were attached to the exterior of churches where they were visible to outsiders. For for this reason, the visual images conveyed by choice and style of decoration of treasure houses built for secular canons might be intended for a wider audience than for monks. Many treasure houses take the form of a miniature tower consisting of basement, semi or semi-basement, and a number of superimposed rooms. This, of course, is practical. However, and here is uh, some images of treasure houses in France that take this form. However, these buildings closely match the treasure houses called Gats or Philakia that the prophet Ezekiel described in his vision of the heavenly temple. In the mid-12th century, the Parisian canon Richard of St. Victor, in his In Ezekiel, drew the northern Gats of Velakia, treasure house, as a three-story structure crowned with battlements. In order to provide extra security, the lowest story was half buried in the ground. As you can see, the 13th century treasure house at Lincoln originally battlemented, closely matches Richard's drawing. Copies of Richard of St. Victor's work reach a number of libraries in the 12th and 13th century. Volume 237 of the 13th century library of Canterbury Cathedral was Ricardo's de Sancto Victore Continens Libros 24, cum partibus suis. That a copy of Richard of St. Victor's in his Ecclesia was available for study in Lincoln seems not unlikely since its chancellor from 1192 to 1213, William de Monte, had come to Lincoln from the same victory in school in Paris, where Richard had worked, lived and worked. At this point, I can't resist showing you the guts of Philakia, the lower treasure room, at Lincoln, a beautiful chamber that for many years has acted as storage for the cathedral central heating field. A number of treasure houses were centrally found. Their chambers, one above the other, are covered by umbrella vaults whose ribs fan out from a central support. Thus, thus they emulate, sorry, and indeed can be seen as scaled up versions of the vessels which they conserved round pyxes with pyramidal roofs, polygonal sacrament towers, century clams, domed cyboria, whose purpose was to have been as Eucharistic containers. Right, I end this paper with a list of three avenues for further research. Short avenues, or at least I'm going to talk about them very briefly. Well, there are the pixies and so forth. Okay, the first avenue here for research is about the use in treasure houses of the round arch within an architectural framework that is of the Gothic style. 
When it appears in the late 12th century buildings, it may not be so surprising, even though its appearance seems to make a deliberate statement, as in this case at Beverly Minster. However, it is consistently used throughout the medieval period and is seen, for example, in Prague Cathedral, where the doors into the Wenceslas Chapel, itself the treasure house of the crown of Bohemia, and the windows of the two-story sacristy to the north of the choir are round-headed within a building whose architectural language is Gothic. Similarly, the windows of the treasure house of the 14th century Frauenkirche in Nuremberg are round, a deliberate departure from the pointed arches of the rest of the building. The deliberate use of the old-fashioned style was highlighted in the late 20th century by Kucha when he showed its use on reliquaries and cyborium. He hypothesized that this choice of design, quote, gave the viewer the impression of greater antiquity, which reinforced the authenticity of the relic. <coughs> the second potential research subject is the care taken to provide sacristies with ambitious faults. The importance placed in pro providing sacristy with a stone vault can be cleaned from the Dom Dominicans who insisted that neither should the church be built in stone, but never like less qualified this, quote, except perhaps over the church, over the choir, and the sacristy. A stone vault is, of course, a safe blast against fire. However, sacristy vaults encountered in a significant number of examples in, in my study are extremely ambitious, including the vault at Canterbury Vestiarium, the vaults of St. Pallian Cologne, um, of Lincoln Cathedral, um, and uh, of um, uh, and, and of these examples here. Uh, examples of the, of the ambitious vaults have included, sorry, I've done that bit. Um, recently, Yves Gallet, in discussing an oversailing pendant vault within the 13th cent century sacristy of saint paul de croix noted that, quote, it is curious that they should have placed such a spectacular and up-to-date ornament in a place where it was never going to be seen. And as you see, this happened in Prague as well. Like the altar, the sacristy, as I have argued, could claim to be the tomb of Christ. In this respect, its vaulting served to signify its sacred role in the same way as that of an altar ciborium. In Bristol, the same type of vaulting was chosen for the sacristy, as had been used a few years previously over Christ's tomb, the Easter Sepulchre in the Cathedral. Third and final avenue of research is the, pre the presence of menacing corbel heads in many sacristies. The most famous of these are within 13th century sacristy, the St. Faith Chapel of Westminster Abbey. But they find their counterparts in the treasure houses of Lincoln in Exeter and in the Westminster Royal Jewel Tower. Now, I hope you can see from this boss, it is a four heads with flattened boxers' noses, wide open mouths, and menacing rows of teeth. Finally, within the sacristy of Bristol Cathedral, situated above the tabernacle, which held the reserved sacrament, is a corbel head whose mouth gapes open, showing beyond a row of upper teeth a hideous view into the mouth cavity. Most distasteful of all, a huge tongue lolls downwards, projecting to the extent that it almost appears to be licking the finial of the tabernacle before the below. So, you will see from this that treasure houses have much of interest within them for the visitor. And my conclusion is that treasure houses are in danger. 
In Europe, their contents are being moved out, leaving them without a role. In England, the roles that they've recently fulfilled, for, for instance, for choir practice, are being brought to an end. This conference should shut sound the alert. Thank you very much.